Chapter 36 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 36 Bad and Perverted Uses of Spiritualism. Every gift or power can be abused. Many in the past have turned their increased psychic powers into evil channels at various times in the world's history, and who continue to do so today. They are known as magicians, witches, vampires, possessors of the evil eye, etc., etc. For the moment, it may be pointed out that psychic unfoldment and increase of psychic power brings with it added responsibility. As our power in this direction is increased, so also we are expected to use it rightly. If much has been given us, much is expected. It is quite possible, it is true, for these powers to be turned to bad account and others injured wealth acquired, etc., temporarily by their use. But if these powers are used for these purposes, they are usually soon lost, and then the student is in a far worse condition than before, for the reason that he is not only without the added power which he craves, but also has deteriorated mentally, morally, and physically as the result of their harmful use. The Difference Between Magic and Mediumship In the Middle Ages, psychic powers were undoubtedly used for good and bad purposes. White magic was beneficial, and black magic harmful. White magic invoked angels. Black magic invoked devils. In neither case were the spirits of departed human beings called upon, but rather intelligences, either lower or higher than man in the human scale of evolution. Another thing which distinguishes mediumship from magic is that mediumship is more in the nature of a request, a calling upon human intelligences for help and advice. Magic, on the other hand, depends upon invocation or demanding the presence and assistance of other intelligences differing from the human, and their assistance in the work to be performed. How Invocations Are Performed For the purposes of this invocation, various magical practices were undertaken such as prayer, the saying of certain words and sentences, preparation of the magic circle with its pentagram, seal of Solomon, etc., as well as utilizing various magical preparations secured from dead bodies and the poisons of animals and reptiles, etc. These magical practices were usually undertaken at certain seasons and phases of the moon, after long training on the part of the magician, and in specially prepared rooms or localities, which had been kept apart only for magical purposes. Exact descriptions of such invocations and the methods employed are to be found in certain rare books on the ritual of magic. But inasmuch as they are neither healthy nor desirable, we do not deem it wise or right to place these teachings before the student, who might be tempted, did he possess the knowledge, to put them into operation, and thus injure himself mentally and morally, perhaps beyond repair. Students who are interested may consult A. E. Waite, The Book of Black Magic and of Pax, Levi, The Doctrine and Ritual of Transcendental Magic, etc. An Explanation of Witchcraft During the Middle Ages also, 
witchcraft flourished it depended upon the use of certain psychic powers which witches were said to possess only in their cases this power came directly from the devil himself being bestowed upon them in person by his satanic majesty the witches were all said to meet two or three times a year on some lonely mountain top at midnight these meetings being called sabbaths at these sabbaths all sorts of magical and anti-religious ceremonies were held the sacrament was mocked the devil was worshipped etc the witch was said to swear allegiance to the devil who thereupon touched her on some part of the body which became anaesthetic lacking all sensation these marks occurred in various parts of the body and such marks were consequently known as witch marks the probable explanation of such cases is that in connection with the abnormal mental and physical states induced by witches there resulted in a peculiar form of hysteria in which small zones or patches on the body became anaesthetic modern science now recognizes the existence of such insensible patches and calls them anaesthetic zones they are typical of this form of hysteria this is the modern scientific explanation of the so-called witch marks the journeys to the sabbaths were doubtless for the most part imaginary flights resulting from the administration of opiates and other drugs which they were known to take and with which they anointed their bodies at the same time it is probable that there were many genuine supernormal psychical phenomena connected with witchcraft and this is becoming more and more probable as we progress in the understanding of such cases devil worship another form of perverted occultism is that of devil worship which exists in various forms even today in paris the malay peninsula in london in new york and doubtless in other large cities at these meetings which are devoted to devil worship various invocations etc are gone through and the devil is said to appear in person and bestow power upon certain privileged members of the club who are thereafter enabled to use certain powers to their own advantage many of the scenes of these devil worshipping societies are too revolting to be described but have been pictured at length on one or two occasions by those who have taken part in these invocations the evil eye again certain individuals have a power which is known as the evil eye this is particularly believed in by the peasants of naples and southern italy by the peasantry of southern spain austria and other countries anyone possessing the evil eye is supposed to have the power of bewitching or maiming any person or animal upon whom he throws his glance cattle looked at by one possessing the evil eye invariably become sick and die crops fail pestilence falls etc the evil eye is a gift which is usually unsought but comes spontaneously and is not desired by anyone the sure way to guard against the evil eye according to the beliefs of the countries mentioned is to extend the first and fourth fingers of the hand toward the possessors of the evil eye the second and third fingers being folded over into the palm of the hand and kept there by the thumb in this position the outer fingers somewhat resemble the horns of a bull 
and if the hand holding the fingers in this position be pointed at any of the children or beggars in the above-named countries they will usually turn and fly from the sign maker many europeans use this knowledge to rid themselves of uh, pestilent beggars vampires and how they attack another form of evil influence which is said to exist and is particularly believed in by the natives of silesia moravia and southern carpathia is that covered by the general word vampire in our ordinary language a vampire is a species of bat and the word is employed because human vampires were said to assume the shape of large bats at times flying in the windows when their victims are asleep a vampire is one who sucks the lifeblood of his victims through two small holes punctured in the skin in very much the same way that a mosquito sucks our blood after puncturing the epidermis these holes are said to occur usually in the throat and the victim is of course attacked as a rule during sleep those who are vampires after they are dead and buried are enabled in some miraculous way it is said to leave their coffins and tombs and wander about seeking victims when they are dug up they are found fresh with a pink complexion and the whole body engorged with blood the only sure way to kill vampires it is said is to drive a stake through the heart or cut off the head when a quantity of fresh blood will gush forth and the vampire is killed forever tradition also says that those who are bitten by vampires become vampires in turn modern vampirage vampires of a certain sort however are not unknown in our own day in an interesting article on vampires in the occult review june 1908 dr franz hartmann described a method of what might be termed natural vampirage he refers to the bible first kings one and also alludes to certain processes by which one person is enabled to draw vital energy from another by establishing close contact this process of nature is governed by well-fixed laws through ignorance of these laws many people have become victims of modern vampirage another form of perverted occultism which remains is the employment of charms amulets talismans etc which are often sold for the purpose of inducing mental and physical disease and black magic which has existed through all ages we must not forget also the so-called voodoo practices of the natives of west africa which are said to be remarkable by those who have witnessed them how to protect yourself from occult and evil influences it is often a little difficult for the modern student of the occult to determine just how much he is to believe in these stories undoubtedly most of them are based on superstition fanaticism and imagination at the same time there is enough truth in them to make us be cautious and put us on our guard never under any circumstances should you undertake to practice any of them for low selfish purposes in order to protect yourself from influences of this sort if you feel that they are being wielded against you resort to the measures outlined in previous chapters and you may be sure that if you do this you will be impervious to all ordinary influences of this kind 
End of chapter 36. Chapter 37 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hayward Carrington. Chapter 37 Snares and Pitfalls to Avoid. The cautious student of psychics who desires to progress along the right lines scientifically and mathematically must be on his guard against all possible sources of delusion and error which may creep into his development, so he may never mistake the false for the true or spurious phenomena for the genuine. A few sources of error and some of the mistakes which the psychic student is apt to make will be pointed out in this chapter, together with the means and methods of guarding against them. First of all, do not be too credulous of the phenomena you receive and accept. If you have a chill or a nervous twitch, do not assume that this is some message or a touch from a spirit hand. It may be so, but you must receive good proof of the fact before accepting it. Should you be too credulous and accept all such incidents as genuine phenomena, you will soon be led away so far that you will become unbalanced in your point of view. The Over-Negative Condition in your development, do not be too negative. Hold the mind always centered and conscious, as I have said, and keep the center of yourself always active. It is only safe to abandon this in very advanced studies. Do not be too negative in your daily life or accept the advice which spirits or mediums give you to the exclusion of all else. You should reason in such matters thus. An intelligence has offered me certain advice. If that person were yet alive and offered me the same advice, would I take it? You should accept the advice of spirits as you would that of human beings who are merely spirits still in the flesh. In other words, as so often pointed out before in previous chapters, use your own judgment and discrimination on all messages received. If the messages are of an erratic nature, such as those which ask you to give up your position, go on a long journey, etc., you should be most cautious and only accept such advice after you have fully proved to your own satisfaction that it is wise and beneficial. Abuse of the Sixth Sense Do not depend upon your sixth sense until you have exhausted the senses you already possess. If you refuse to let these work, you can hardly suppose that help and assistance will come from outside. No, seed will not grow in a soil that is not prepared, neither will spiritual help be planted in your mental soil if you have not worked to prepare it for the spiritual influx. As a rule, our own individual spirit is the best guide. We must consult this first. After that, if you seek additional advice and help, this may often be obtained from wise and experienced psychics, but I cannot too strongly warn the student against accepting the advice of poorly developed mediums, either professional or amateur. On changing mediums and circles, it is not a good thing to change developing mediums if this can be avoided. If you have found one medium who can assist you to develop and who is apparently doing so helpfully and rightly, Stick to him through thick and thin until his advice or help fails you. The mixture of magnetism which is introduced with change of developing mediums may be at times very harmful. The same thing may be said of circles. Once a circle of sitters is formed, the same group should sit night after night, and it is not at all a good practice to allow strangers constantly to intrude into the circle and take the places of others. If changes must be made, let one at a time assume the place of the absent sitter and let him sit thoroughly familiar with the surroundings and conditions before a second change is made. You would be wise to mistrust names of important historical persons if they appear in your own speech or writing or if they are obtained at seances. Our natural vanity may lead us to hope and expect that such personages may be present, but there is evidence that in many cases lying spirits have taken the place of those whose names they gave. In this connection, it may be said that the historical personages are not, as a rule, most desirable. The best help and the greatest teachings have been obtained from simple people who are now on the other side. Sensitivity and Mediumship Do not try from the first to develop as a medium. Try rather to cultivate your own psychic powers and strengthen your own inner nature. After you have developed psychically and spiritually in this way, you'll be far better enabled to receive and transmit genuine mediumistic messages. Better enabled also to interpret them. Better able to withstand the strain of mediumship and run far less danger of obsession and other unpleasant symptoms which badly developed mediums are likely to encounter. Cultivate your psychic self, therefore, and after this has been truly trained, begin to train your mediumistic powers. 
Be on the lookout for evil and lying spirits who will constantly deceive you if you are not prepared for them and remain too open and receptive. Study your own phenomena and endeavor to disengage genuine psychic and mediumistic manifestations from those due to your own subconscious mind. This is an excellent and very helpful practice which will prove useful to you as you progress. Do not assume that all figures which you see are spirits. They may be thought forms, doubles, etheric bodies, or imaginary creations of your own. Things a psychic should avoid. You can only learn to disentangle this wonderful chain and separate the true from the false after months and perhaps years of study, observation, and experiment. Above all, remember that symbolic figures and representations must be interpreted symbolically and should never be accepted as representing the truth as it actually exists. One of the great dangers to the amateur medium, as before explained, is that of extending his symbolic, intuitive impressions beyond the proper point. If he stated only what was given him, he would usually be right, but if he endeavors to interpret them himself, find their explanations, etc., he very often goes wrong. Do not hang on too long, so to say, to the impressions and images you perceive. Let them float before you in space, seeing and analyzing them as they pass. Do not endeavor to hold them to you by the power of your mind. If you do so, they will not only vanish and disappear, but you will be unable to retain the impression you receive, and quite possibly the power of perceiving these images which you now possess will become less and less and gradually leave you. Always remember that psychic phenomena of this character cannot be commanded. They can only be sought and welcomed when they appear. In other words, they are spontaneous and not experimental phenomena. How to distinguish the true from the false If you constantly make use of your own judgment and critical faculty in studying the phenomena which you develop or those which you may observe in others, you will build up within yourself two things. One of these is the power of judging, that is the ability to perceive the true from the false, and which above all else is what you as a psychic desire. It is difficult to explain the difference in words, but as nearly as possible it may be said that these phenomena which are innately true carry with them a sense of conviction, a feeling of warmth and familiarity, and we feel them as part of ourselves. The other phenomena, although occurring in our own minds, will seem to us cold, strange, and extraneous, and when once this power to distinguish between the two types of phenomena has been developed, you have taken one of the most important forward steps that is possible for any psychic to take. Many mediums indeed never reach this state. Their mediumship is chaotic. It has never been developed on rational progressive lines, but if you have done so, you may rest assured that you are not only a genuine and true medium, but you have passed through the early stages and danger zones which so often beset the student in the early stages of development. How to guard against outside influence. The second important step which the student takes after he has once passed this stage is that while he will be sensitive and receptive to telepathic clairvoyant and other forms of perception, and also to spirits both in and out of the body, he will be practically impervious to harmful or malicious thoughts and influences which may be impelled against him not only on this sphere, but by the spirit world as well. If a trance clairvoyant during a state of ecstasy leaves his body and wanders off into space without having previously gained sufficient knowledge and hence control of the situation, he is liable to be blown hither and thither, figuratively speaking, like a soap bubble by the breezes, and will be open to impressions from all sources. These he may not feel or know at the time, but he may carry these back with him into his body and afterwards they may affect him to the detriment of his own mental and spiritual health. In other words, he has not learned to protect himself while severed from the body as he can while in it. This is one of the greatest dangers which the advanced psychic is liable to encounter, and at the same time, after he has once learned the secret of protecting himself in this manner, he may be assured that thenceforward his progress will be most marked and rapid not only in psychic and mediumistic development, but in the spirit world after he has entered it permanently at death. The value of psychic development to the individual. Psychic development is, therefore, of inestimable worth, if rightly cultivated for the rapid progression of the individual human spirit, just as much as the same power badly employed is harmful to the human spirit, both here and hereafter. 
It all depends on the manner in which these forces and powers have been cultivated and are utilized. And while too much cannot be said against their improper use, a great deal may be said in favor of their proper application and development in the right direction. It is my hope that every reader of this book will develop himself along the right lines, and that he may receive help, advice, and encouragement at all stages of his spiritual unfoldment, both here and hereafter. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Ward Carrington Chapter 38 Physical Phenomena the physical phenomena of spiritualism, as distinct from the mental or psychical phenomena, are those which relate to the physical world and in which some mechanical or physical movement of matter takes place. In clairvoyance, for example, no such physical phenomena occur, so far as we can see. But if a table be lifted into the air by supernormal means, we here come into contact with mechanical and physical forces, and with these we have to reckon. Phenomena with Physical Contact We must begin at the beginning in treating of physical phenomena and go back, first of all, to those which involve some form of contact. Doubtless you have seen performances of so-called mind readers who found lost articles which were hidden in various parts of the room or hall, when one who knew their hiding place held the psychic's hand or placed it to his forehead, etc. In most of these performances it is not mind reading at all, strictly speaking, which we see, but what is technically known as muscle reading, that is, the faint, unconscious twitchings of the muscles of the person holding the psychic's hand are felt and interpreted by him, consciously or unconsciously, and these guide him to the spot where the article is hidden. Incredible as it may appear, this is the correct explanation of these cases, and you may easily test it for yourself by asking a group of your friends to hide some object while you are out of the room, and then when you enter to give you one of their hands. If now you concentrate on the faint pullings and pushings which they will give you, you will be enabled to find the article in nine cases out of ten. Of course, this, like everything else, improves with practice, and you must not expect to be an expert on the first trial. Some performers who have had years of experience grow so proficient in this, however, that they are enabled to open safes whose combinations they do not know, or merely holding the hand of one who does, or even drive a cab along the streets of a crowded city while blindfolded and holding the hand of one who can see the vehicles on the street. The Development of Independent Force and Power The next step is in planchette writing, where the hand, as before explained, moves at first as the result of unconscious muscular action. After a time, however, some psychic force seems to be developed and the board often continues to move about even after the hands of the operator are removed from it. Beyond this again, we have those cases of so-called dousing, where the forked hazel twig bends to and fro in the hands of the water finder when he walks over water and metals. The simple movements which are felt at first are probably due to muscular twitchings, but as the force develops, it seems to become more independent and the twig is bent in spite of the efforts to hold it. Table Tipping and Levitations The next class of physical phenomena are those with the table. A group sits around an ordinary table and can tilt and tip it, as many have doubtless seen. The first simple movements here, as formerly, are probably due to the unconscious muscular pressure of those having their hands on the table. But later on, as the psychic force develops and charges the table, it seems to assume an independent character and the table often continues to move when all hands are withdrawn from it. In fact, as an expert psychic student has pointed out, in many instances, and especially under unfavorable conditions, the phenomena do not rise above the initial stage of simple, non-intelligent movements, leaving the impression on the minds of the investigators that the force exhibited is, if at present unknown and unaccounted for, nevertheless a natural and mechanical one and that the action of independent intelligence in connection with it cannot be conceived. This has been the experience and has been the verdict of even scientific inquirers who have not hesitated to give that verdict to the world. How the power increases. Such a conclusion is based upon inaccurate knowledge and upon imperfect and superficial observation. 
All experienced psychic students are aware that it is often only after repeated and prolonged sittings that the full development of the psychic force is obtained, and that independent intelligence is exhibited in connection with it, and that in by far the larger number of instances that stage of the experiment is never reached at all. That it is, however, the ultimate issue of the experiment is now admitted by all patient and painstaking students who have devoted sufficient time to the observation of the phenomena and who have carried on their investigations with an open mind and in a systematic manner. As will be seen later on, it is fully admitted that the mysterious force, thus called into operation in some unknown way, issues from the physical organism of the sensitive and the sitters, and is in itself an unintelligent force but it is with equal confidence asserted that when it is available in sufficient quantity and is wholly detached from the physical organism it can be and beyond all doubt is frequently manipulated by intelligences independent of and other than that of the psychic and the investigators assisting in the experiment how physical phenomena are produced the principle upon which many physical phenomena are based then is simply this there is a vital or a nervous force existing in many of us, as described in an earlier chapter, which is usually limited to the surface of our own bodies, so that unless we touch the object in question, we cannot move it. Under certain conditions, however, this vital energy or fluid is capable of being projected outward beyond the normal bodily limits into space, and when powerful enough, is capable of moving physical objects with which it comes into contact or if it be a rapid outward projection of this force it produces percussive sounds or raps well known to spiritualists this psychic force is often uncontrolled and then objects are moved without the knowledge of and even against the wish of the medium we then have the so-called spontaneous poltergeist phenomena etc at other times this force may be guided and manipulated by the conscious or unconscious mind of the medium Beyond this stage, again, is one in which the medium is unconscious of what is occurring, having passed into trance, etc. And it is then that many of the most striking physical phenomena occur. At such times, complicated and intelligent physical manifestations are produced which are not due either to the mind of the medium or to any person present. Externalized Vital Energy we here enter the realm of genuine physical phenomena produced by spirit intelligences. Most of the communications are obtained through raps following a code. Playing upon musical instruments, etc., are due to this source. In other words, after a certain point has been reached, the externalized vital energy or psychic power of the medium is manipulated by an external intelligence, and they can even create forms or phantoms by utilizing it, as will be explained in the chapter devoted to materialization. Controlling the Phenomena Very interesting experiments have been conducted in the past in controlling these physical phenomena, but not much success has been attained in this direction. There is here a wide field for experiment which the thoughtful student might enter. Thus, on one occasion, a medium who has had the power of producing raps was hypnotized, and it was suggested that raps should be produced at will according to the suggestion of the hypnotist. This was completely successful. It was also suggested that wraps be obtained in any article of furniture which the hypnotist would suggest. This also succeeded. The range and variety of physical phenomena are very great, including manifestations such as wraps, table levitations, movement of objects without contact, playing upon musical instruments without apparent cause, spirit and thought photography, materialization, slate writing, trumpet phenomena, etc. The Effect of Light All physical phenomena seem to be hindered very largely by light, either daylight or artificial light, and they can very rarely be produced except in darkness. Should you attempt to obtain phenomena of this character, therefore, it would be well for you to sit in the darkness, especially at first, and then request that more and more light be permitted as your power increases and the phenomena appear. Most mediums begin their development by seating themselves in a cabinet in a darkened room, and often it is necessary to sit in this way for every evening for several weeks or even months before any phenomena appear. If you are naturally psychic, however, and physical phenomena are going to be manifested through your mediumship, 
you would doubtless only have to sit for a fraction of this time in order for the first manifestations to make themselves felt. And probably afterwards, you would be so interested in the process that you would not count the time you spent in your development. First Symptoms and Phenomena It is probable that the first indications of phenomena of this character you will receive are tiny spots of light which form before you in space, and either suddenly appear or remain stationary for some time, and then join themselves together forming one larger light. As time progresses you will see that this light cloudy mass will become more and more definite in outline and shape, and will probably begin to assume the shape of a phantom or form standing before you. When this stage has been reached, you should concentrate your receptive faculties and endeavor to get on rapport with this form, for such it now is, and after a time you will be doubtless be able to establish more or less intelligent mental communication and exchange messages. This will usually appear before physical phenomena become manifest though in certain cases it may be later on. Dr. Baraduc of Paris succeeded on several occasions in photographing those groups of light or masses of matter which thus floated before him, and the student who has once succeeded in receiving manifestations of a like nature might well conduct similar experiments if he be sufficiently alert and able to do so. If not, a friend who is with him and has attended his process of development might endeavor to take these photographs at the moment when the psychic states they are vividly present before him. There are thus two ways of cultivating physical mediumship. One is to sit in the dark, the other is to experiment more or less consciously in light or semi-darkness, and when a certain amount of power has been gained in this direction, to endeavor to transfer or carry this over into the dark seance and to transmit this power to a spirit who will thenceforth utilize it and by its aid produce physical phenomena. Developing in the Dark If you sit for physical development in the dark, you are never sure what kind of phenomena you are to obtain. In a seance this is beneficial, since you should never aim to get one type of phenomenon. As before explained, for if you do, you shut out by your attitude all other phenomena which might spontaneously develop. At the same time, it is always satisfactory for the beginner to be able to control his phenomena a little, especially at first, and for this reason the second method of experimentation is advisable, and if desired might be carried out at the same time as the other method of development, so that the two progress side by side. If you sit in the dark, you should by all means provide yourself with a cabinet, since this will tend to concentrate the force and much less energy will have to be expended by you for the production of any phenomena you may obtain. Also, you should abstain from using your will or thinking consciously of practical everyday affairs. Make the mind blank, holding only the thought of self and await results. How to develop in the light. In developing your power for the production of physical phenomena along the other line mentioned, it is best to begin with the simple experiments and gradually work up to the more complicated ones. For example, begin with a planchette or Ouija board, placing the tips of the fingers on the board, and after it has begun to move rapidly to and fro or round and round, very gradually withdraw the hand and see whether or not the board continues to move about. Again, when the table has begun to tip and rise into the air, two or three legs, as a result of placing your hands upon it, Gradually withdraw your fingers and see whether the table remains suspended, or when it is at its highest point and you feel that it is thoroughly charged with your fluid, drop the whole force of your being into your will and see if you cannot levitate the table completely from the floor. Again, if wraps are coming on the table upon which your hands rest, see if these cannot be obtained when your hands are removed a fraction of an inch from its surface, and if they are, Endeavor to produce wraps by making a motion towards the table as though hitting it, stopping short a quarter or half an inch above its surface. If you are successful, a rap or a sound in the tabletop will come following this movement. Instruments for testing your power. A number of simple devices have been constructed with the object of testing mediumship in its early stages, and one or two of these you can make at home, and this would prove very helpful to you. Thus, you might suspend a small pitch or cork ball by means of a silk thread five or six inches long from a hook. If now you place the fingers of one hand almost touching this ball and leave it there for some moments, you may, if successful, succeed in causing this ball to move either towards or away from your fingers as you will. 
This is a very useful little experiment which may be tried on many occasions and will be found very beneficial in developing simple physical phenomena. Another device which may be employed is the following. Procure a straw, such as used at the soda fountains, and pass a needle through it directly in the center. Press the lower end of the needle into a large flat cork. See that the straw revolves easily upon the slightest pressure. Place your fingers nearly touching one end of the straw and will that it shall move either to the right or to the left. This instrument has proved very successful in many cases and will probably prove more sensitive than the last. There are more complicated scientific instruments which have been devised to test the externalization of the human fluid and the power of the will. These instruments have been used with great benefit by many scientific students. How to begin When the student has progressed thus far, he is ready to try his first experiment in the movement of physical objects lying on his table. Begin with a very small, light object such as a cork. Do not choose any metal object. Place the fingertips of both hands on either side of the object nearly touching it. Wait until you feel distinct tingling sensations in the fingers, and if this sensation extends to the elbows or even to the shoulders, so much the better. Endeavor to construct by your will and imagination, so to speak, a fine thread or hair composed of psychic rays passing between your fingers and supporting the object in question. Concentrate on this for some moments before you make any physical movement. Then, very slowly raise the fingers and see whether the cork is influenced to follow the upper directions of your fingers. If so, you have begun your course of physical mediumship. As this initial experiment is very important, it would be well to dwell upon it at somewhat greater length, since nothing is so discouraging to the beginner as innumerable tests and experiments of this kind which fail one after the other. Of course, perfectly non-mediumistic persons will con continue to fail, but your natural psychics will not. How to obtain the first phenomena We have seen in an earlier chapter that the aura extends from the body and particularly the fingertips and that the human fluid is capable of projection at will. Now it is this fluid which is the basis or substance out of which the psychic threads or rays are spun and these threads, when they have stretched from fingers to finger and gained sufficient solidity are capable of lifting quite heavy objects. Dr. Ochorovitz, who has studied these rays for years, calls them rigid rays, and asserts that his medium, Mademoiselle Tomchik, can by an effort of will construct a psychic thread so strong that it can be heard scraping against solid objects and even seen occasionally. Yet it does not exist as a physical reality, for the space between the fingers and the object may be cut without severing the connection. Now these psychic threads are woven not of a physical but of etheric or astral matter. And as we do not know as yet how to mold or manipulate this accurately, we have to do the best we can by the power of the human will. The process to be followed, therefore, is first, vivid imaginary construction of these rays or threads, second, projection of the vital fluid, and third, the weaving of this together into the rigid rays by an effort of will. If the student can follow this process and persistently carry out the instructions, he will doubtless succeed in time in moving small, light objects. That is, if he is at all gifted with this phase of mediumship. How to construct the vital threads of rigid rays. The details of this process may now be given. First of all, place yourself in a relaxed, restful condition. Then think intently of the threads or rays which you wish to produce. Imagine these just like any other threads coming from your fingertips and becoming more and more dense and solid as they emerge. Think of the strips of fluid you saw between your fingertips in trying the experiments mentioned in Chapter 25, devoted to the human fluid. When you have formed these vital rays clearly in your mind and have them all ready to project, so to say, extend the fingers and by a strong effort of will, endeavor to project this energy into the space beyond the fingertips. After a very few trials, you will doubtless begin to do so. This you will feel in the form of pins and needles sensations in the fingertips. They will also get warm, perhaps perspire. When this second stage has been reached, you are ready to proceed with the third. The fluid thus projected is not in the form of rigid rays or threads, but rather a vaporous mass, a soft cloud, if the term be allowed, and you must toughen and strengthen this by willpower. After the projection has taken place, think and will intently that this shall happen, and this happening, 
and at the same time imagine your consciousness in your fingertips themselves molding and toughening these vital rays. If you do this, you will surely succeed in time, provided you go at the exercise in the right manner and stick to it persistently. Transferring the Power When the student has progressed thus far, the final step must be taken, namely the transferring of this power to the control of a spirit or outside intelligence. This is a very delicate and subtle process, which is very little understood even by mediums. The best process is gradually to develop the power of going into trance coincidentally with the development of these physical phenomena. Once you have gained the power of projecting your fluid at will and moving material objects by its aid, which is probably attained by an extreme effort of will, you should endeavor to hand over this manipulative power to another intelligence. You cannot do this consciously, so you can only hope that the transference will take place when you have passed into trance. You should endeavor, therefore, to pass into trance while actually conducting the above-mentioned experiments, and the proof of the fact that this transference does take place is found in the fact that the most striking physical phenomena at a seance always occurs when the medium is in deep trance. The deeper the trance, the better the phenomena. In other words, the more the medium's will is in abeyance, the more opportunity is there given to the external will of the spirit to become active and bring about the required results. This fact is very strikingly proved by nearly all the best physical mediums in the history of spiritualism. Gathering Vital Energy from the Circle If you are unable to move material objects alone, you may perhaps be enabled to do so after gathering strength from others. You may do this either by forming a chain and gathering this energy by an effort of will before you make your experiment, or by placing your hands in position and asking the two members of the chain nearest to you to place their hands upon your temples, or one on your forehead, and the other over the solar plexus. In this way a vital magnetic current is established which may greatly add to your powers and enable you to move objects and produce phenomena where you would otherwise fail. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 39 Spirit and Thought Photography Spirit photographs are based on the belief that there is a spiritual body resembling in appearance the physical body, which is sufficiently solid to be photographed by means of the camera and sensitive plates. Usually more than this is necessary, namely the presence of a medium or psychic, possessing the peculiar power of rendering the spiritual body apparent to the camera. The medium seems to act as a sort of connecting link or intermediary between the body and the photographic plate, though the exact nature of the mediumistic influence is as yet unknown. Here is a field for study by expert photographers and by scientists to ascertain its limits and extent. How Spirit Photography is Possible To many it may appear incredible that any spiritual body is sufficiently material to be photographed by the camera for it would mean that this body is capable of reflecting light waves, this being the primary necessity in obtaining photographs at all. Yet, as Sir Oliver Lodge has pointed out, there is hardly anything more incredible in this than in taking the photograph of the reflection of an object in the mirror, which is quite possible. In this case, there is no solid object photographed, merely the reflected light waves which are themselves intangible and invisible. We know from experiment that the photographic camera is far more sensitive than the human eye. Physicians tell us that it is possible to photograph an eruption on the body before it actually occurs, that is, before it is visible to us, such as smallpox. On the other hand, it is also possible to photograph thousands of stars in the heavens, which are invisible to the eye, even with the most powerful telescope. A photographic plate can therefore detect objects insensible to the eye, and hence it is reasonable to suppose, insomuch as spiritual bodies doubtless exist, but are just beyond the range of our vision, that the camera should be quite able to detect them, and spirit photographs are the result. Two sources of error and how to guard against them. In obtaining spirit photographs, you must be on your guard against two possible sources of error. The first is that you are liable to see faces and likenesses in the photographs which do not really exist at all you construct them in imagination as you would faces in a coal fire. The second danger to be avoided, if you are dealing with a professional spirit photographer, is that of fraud. 
There has doubtless been much trickery in this department in the past, and if you wish to be sure that you are not victimized, you should take your own plates with you, see them inserted in the camera, and watch their development after the picture has been taken. Even in this case, you are liable to be imposed upon unless you are very careful. How to begin your development The most satisfactory course to pursue is to experiment yourself and not depend upon a professional spirit photographer for your results. If you are at all sensitive and persevering, you will doubtless obtain genuine spirit photographs at the end of a certain period of time. Many hundreds of persons have done so, and there is no reason why you should not, if you are determined to obtain them. The best method is to sit privately with a friend of yours who is both sympathetic and more or less mediumistic, and hold a short seance, seated at the table before you begin your experiments in photography. If you obtain messages by means of tippings of the table, raps, automatic writing, etc., so much the better, and if intelligent communication is thus established, ask your spirit friends to appear for you on the plate when the experiments are being held. They may promise to do so, but fail to appear. Do not be discouraged by this, as they may be perfectly willing to help you, but for some reason or another are unable to make their forms visible on the photographic plate. If you persist, however, you will doubtless obtain interesting results in a short time. How to take the photographs after this preliminary seance, you should seat your subject in a chair against the dark background and focus the camera as you would were you taking this picture in the ordinary way. The photographic plate should, if possible, be held by both of you between your hands in the dark room before being inserted in the camera so as to get it impregnated with your magnetism. After he has taken up his position and the camera is properly focused, you should then ask your spirit friends to come and appear on the plate if possible. Do not exercise your will, however, nor think of any special object in particular, nor any person, but make your mind negative. If positive, you are quite likely to obtain thought photographs instead. Ask your invisible helpers to give you some sign, if possible, such as three raps when they are ready to appear, etc. If you obtain these, take the picture at once. If not, sit until you get into the requisite mental condition then take the photograph and afterwards develop it carefully. It is improbable that you will obtain any definite results for the first few experiments, but many do, even from the start, and this is doubtless one of the most promising of all the fields of psychic investigation for the student to enter. Radiographs and how to obtain them. The next thing to do is to endeavor to secure photographs of the rays or aura of the human body. These impressions on the photographic plate are secured comparatively rarely for the reason that the body of the subject must become radioactive to some extent before an impression of this kind is possible. Such pictures are consequently called radiographs, and a number of these have been obtained by Dr. Chorovich of Poland. The rays in question, which impress the photographic plates in such cases, seem to emanate from the etheric double and not from the physical body for the reason that they do not follow the anatomical distribution of the nerves of the body. The double, detached after the manner described in chapter 26, can often affect the plates in this way, and spirits can do so, but it is not common for the human body to be able thus to affect them. How to obtain thought photographs. The third and most interesting phase, in a sense, for the experimenter is that of thought photography. The most sensitive plates that can be procured should be used for this purpose and the experiment conducted in the dark, as indeed should the radiograph experiments. The plate may be held between the palms of the hands, or placed against the forehead, or over the solar plexus next to the skin, and must be left there for a considerable time, half an hour or longer, if possible. During this time the subject should think intensely of a certain figure or object, such as a cat, a chair, a ship, as the case may be. He should keep this before his mind vividly and intensely and never allow it to become blurred or indistinct. Holding it there by an effort of will, he should next endeavor to impress this upon the photographic plate and should also try to feel inwardly the process going on within him, the flow of the magnetic current to the spot beneath the plate, etc. Another way to produce thought photographs Another way of obtaining thought photographs is to place a plate wrapped in black paper or placed in an opaque black envelope on the table, and over it place the fingertips for some time, 
usually from five to ten minutes. Then think or will that a certain thought or image will be impressed upon the plate. And if you are at all developed along this line, the impress will be left on the plate through the paper. Any object can be selected, a round ring of light, a triangle, a face, etc. It is best to begin with simple objects because the mind seems to be able to impress this upon the plate more readily and clearly than a more complex object, of which it cannot form so clear an outline. You must not be disappointed if you do not succeed at first in this, and you may have to develop, and thus spoil, a number of plates before you get any impression at all upon them. The first thing you will get, probably, will be a spot of light, or a series of small spots, as the fluid finds its way through the opaque paper onto the plate. You must remember that the human fluid is the instrument or intermediary through which photographs of this character are made, and hence you must learn the art of the projection of this fluid, as outlined in the chapter devoted to physical phenomena, before you can hope successfully to impress a photographic plate. Once you have done so, the rest will be simply a matter of development, and you will find it one of the most interesting and fascinating subjects for the investigation in the whole realm of psychics. Photographs of Psychic Forms and Emotions In many cases, photographs of emotions have been successfully taken, especially of late, and Monsieur Doguet has narrated a number of experiments of this character to the French Academy of Sciences, which has accepted his report as authentic. It is thus evident that thought photography has at length claimed a place in the scientific world, and this being so, it is only a matter of careful experimenting on the student's part before he obtains photographs of his character. An interesting series of experiments might be tried by the scientifically minded inquirer, namely to obtain photographs of mediums in trance, while they are obtaining automatic writing, crystal gazing, etc., and also of those who are on the point of dying. Such experiments would doubtless reveal many changes in the aura, and also the presence of thought images, and possibly spirit forms, which would otherwise be quite unsuspected by those present. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Carrington Chapter 40 Materialization Materialization means the process of rendering solid or material, for a longer or shorter time, bodies through which disembodied spirits may function and communicate. Materialization usually occurs at seances in which a group of people are gathered together, and rarely or never when the medium is alone. The reason for this is probably that the necessary conditions are lacking, these being chiefly the lack of sufficient vital energy which is drawn from the circle by the medium and utilized for the purposes of materialization. The Marvels of Materialization Many factors play a part in this mysterious phenomenon. Considered from the physical or material point of view, there is the reality of the phantom, and from the psychological or mental point of view, there is the mind of the materialized entity to account for. If we were always sure that the materialized figure were really the person it claimed to be, this latter difficulty would be overcome, but as we shall see later, there are many objections to the simple view of the case in all instances, and thus the problem is rendered more complex. From the purely physical point of view, the phenomena of materialization are the most baffling and the most mysterious in the whole realm of spiritualism. A few minutes before, nothing existed in the cabinet save the entranced medium. Now, there is a solid, tangible form possessing all the properties and appearances of matter, often having solid flesh and bones just as a human being would, the flesh being warm and lifelike, the hand possessing nails, hair, etc., like an ordinary hand, and being apparently composed of cells and tissues such as any material body would be composed of. How account for this? It is surely one of the most bewildering and incredible facts in nature. The Necessary Factors to Ensure Success From the point of view of spiritualism and psychic development, many factors play a part. There is first of all the physical body of the medium, secondly his vital magnetism, thirdly the magnetism of the sitters forming the circle, fourthly magnetism from disembodied spirits, 
which mingle together and help to create the phantoms that appear at seances. The vital energy which seems to be drawn from the circle, and chiefly from the medium, during the seances is utilized or manipulated by the disembodied spirits, who build up by its aid the materialized form we see before us. This is a very difficult and complicated process, and not all spirits are competent to do this. For this purpose, what are known as spirit chemists are often employed, those who possess the knowledge of how to build up these forms. In the deepest stages of trance, when the medium is unconscious, the communication through materialized figures becomes clearer and clearer and the forms more dense and material. This is true of many psychic phenomena. The deeper the trance, the better the results obtained. Etherealization and Transfiguration In the lighter stages of trance, however, only portions of the figure may develop, such as hands, faces, etc., or very shadowy and vaguely defined outlines of human forms. These latter are not, strictly speaking, materialized, but are known as etherealized forms. They are less solid than the materialized figures, and it is often possible to pass the hand and arm through one of these figures without disturbing it. In the case of the materialized figure, on the other hand, they are just as solid and tangible as human form, and it would be impossible to make any other solid object pass through any part of them. In many cases, the physical body of the medium is more or less altered by the spirits without any other phantom being created. Such cases are known as transfiguration. When the figure created at the seance is not dense and fully formed, it does not possess either a complete or matured intelligence. It is not all there, so to speak, mentally or physically. How some forms are created. There is evidence to show that many of these forms are created by the will of the medium or by discarnate spirits, and that they are more truly thought forms than materialized spirits. Again, many of these figures are doubles or astral bodies belonging to living people who happen to appear at the seance or projections from discarnate spirits. In such case, the intelligence manipulating the phantom is not that of a mature spirit, but is a creation, so to speak, elaborated by the subconscious thoughts of the medium or by the mentality of the sitters forming the circle. The psychic atmosphere created by the minds in this circle has, in other words, produced the mind of the phantom in the same way that the combined vital magnetism of the sitters has produced the material body of the apparition. How Materialization is Accomplished the process of materialization seems to be somewhat as follows. The vital energy being drawn from the sitters into the body of the medium, the latter projects it outward into space, together with a large portion of his own vital energy, or it is drawn out by the operating intelligences. When in space, at a short distance from the medium's body, this vital energy is molded, so to say, into the shape of the materialized form. It is built up or created by the operating intelligences. Between this form and the medium's physical body, there exists a subtle connection, or rapport, which has been described as a thread or bond of union, though it is not a physical connection of any kind, or one that has ever been detected. Yet that such a connection exists is proved by the phenomena of repercussion, referred to in chapter 36, where it is shown that any injury done to the projected form reacted upon the body of the medium and left its mark upon it, just as though the physical form had suffered the injury. This is one of the most striking phenomena in the whole realm of spiritualism, and a case of this character is thus vividly described by the Venerable Archdeacon Colley in his address on spiritualism before the Church Congress which met in October 1905 and subsequently published by him in pamphlet form. He then said, he, the material phantom, seemed to be interested in everything around him, walked up and down the room, taking up various articles to examine them, as would be natural to one of ancient race now in the midst of modern environment. Presently he espied and brought from the sideboard a dish of baked apples, and I got him to eat some. Our medium was at this time six or seven feet away from the spirit form, and had not chosen to take any of the fruit, asserting that he could taste the apple the Egyptian was eating. Wondering how this could be, I with my right hand gave our abnormal friend another apple to eat, 
holding a bit of white paper in my left hand outstretched toward the medium, when from his lips fell the achewed skin and core of the apple eaten by the Mahidi. Here it is before me now, after all these years, and this screwed up bit of paper for any scientist to analyze. In this instance, the phenomena of repercussion was very interestingly demonstrated. The method of the materialization of the figure was thus described by Archdeacon Colley in his lecture. How the figures are formed. When, in expectation of a materialization, there was seen steaming, as from a kettle spout, through the texture and substance of the medium's black coat, a little below the left breast toward the side, a vaporous filament, which was almost invisible until within an inch or two of our friend's body. Then it grew in density to a cloudy something. There would then step forth timidly a figure, as did this little maiden. She was naturally a companion for others of our frequent psychic visitors. For as a cloud received one out of their sight, when the disciples at Bethany gazed on their ascending Lord, so as from a cloud thus inexplicably evolved from the medium, came our materialized friends, and vanished again to invisibility in a cloud, sucked back within his own body, when they were withdrawn from us, wistfully gazing on the mysterious departure and noting this or that particular phase of it within a few inches of the point of their inscrutable disappearance and the vanishment. The Clothes of Materialized Figures The question is often asked, how is it possible for spirits to become clothed? The old question of the clothes of ghosts being often raised among materialistic skeptics of the last century. The same question might be raised against the clothes of materialized figures, but there is a ready answer to this which fully explains it. Those who deny and ridicule the possibility of materialization of remnant, as well as bodies, might ask themselves the question, whence came the clothing which Christ wore after his resurrection? For we are distinctly told that the master's raiment had been parted among the Roman soldiery, and upon his cloak had they cast lots. This historical incident furnishes us with an illustration of the case in point, and the reality of this fact is amply borne out by many modern instances of a like character. How to begin your development In sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, which should not be too large, so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane-bottomed chair, sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. How to begin your development In sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, which should not be too large, so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane-bottomed chair, sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. At first, the medium should hold the hands of those in the circle, but after a time these may be released. The light should be almost totally extinguished for reasons given before in this book. It must be remembered that there are all kinds of light, visible and invisible. We also have infrared rays and ultraviolet rays, the former being below the lowest form of visible vibration and the latter above the highest. It is because red is so low on the scale of vibration that mediums employ it during the seance. Photographs may be taken by infrared and ultraviolet light. Light has a very disintegrating effect on these subtle forms and would doubtless serve to disintegrate many of the materialized forms upon their initial appearance. The medium should make his mind as blank as possible, holding only the central idea of self, and mentally call upon his spirit friends to help in the production of phenomena. Early Signs and Phenomena Among the initial sensations which the medium will experience are probably flashes of heat and cold, blackness before the eyes, in which possibly there may be specks of light dancing hither and thither, and the cobwebby sensation over the hands and face, which is almost invariable and very noticeable. Madame d'Esperance, a materializing medium of international fame, has stated that in her experience this cobwebby sensation was present on practically every occasion. Speaking of the phenomena and symptoms of the process, she says, If a few persons have gathered together in a half-darkened room, the emanations from their bodies can be seen by many, not necessarily clairvoyance. It appears as a slightly luminous haze about the head, shoulders, and sometimes the knees and feet. 
Frequently it gathers slowly at the fingers, increasing in density until it resembles a slight transparent film of slightly luminous cotton wool. This is often perceptible to the eyes of all, but it offers no resistance to the touch. By some force of attraction, either inherent or exerted upon it by some outside agency, this mass appears to mingle and draw together, to become more dense, and at this stage has been found to be decidedly perceptible to the touch. It resembles, as nearly as can be described, the gossamer web seen on trees and bushes on an early summer morning. The Sensation of Cobwebs and What It Means Many persons in a materialization seance are sensible of a feeling as of cobwebs being on their faces and hands. I have myself not only felt the sensation, but when brushing my face or hands have distinctly felt what seemed to be fine filaments of the gossamer which clung to my fingers. The attention of the sitters has been frequently drawn to this almost impalpable substance which has vanished as soon as the light has been brought near it. This emanation from the sitters in a seance is generally, if not always, accompanied by a sensation of chill or draft, similar to that felt by a person in a slightly feverish condition. The head will be hot, there will be a heavy throbbing in the temples. The hands, feet, and other parts of the body will be cold to the touch. The medium, by the exercise of his will, can at any time prevent manifestations. In fact, the opposition of any person in a circle will act as a hindrance to the work of the unseen operators. Why some forms resemble the medium. As a rule, when full materializations are accomplished, the medium is entranced so deeply that he cannot remember the process of the production of the forms. In the earlier stages of trance, the mind should be concentrated on the creation of forms of this character, but after it has reached a certain stage, you may safely turn over the process to your spirit friends. In some instances, the medium's double becomes detached from the body and appears to those forming the circle as a materialized figure, though it is not such in reality. If such a figure be photographed or closely examined, the striking resemblance to the medium is easily seen, though it is not the medium who may be seen entranced within the cabinet. Lack of knowledge of this fact has given rise to the false belief that in cases of this character, the medium himself was consciously personating the spirit. But the true explanation is that the double has been liberated during the seance and has thus appeared to the sitters as an independent being. The phenomena of materialization, as before said, are amongst the most interesting in the whole realm of the supernormal and will well repay careful study and the prolonged experimentation on the part of the student. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 41 Advanced Studies The subject matter and advice contained in the present chapter is advanced only for those who have carefully read through and practiced the preceding chapters of this book. Those who have not done so are strongly advised not to undertake some of the experiments herein described, unless they have carefully carried out the instructions contained in the earlier chapters, and particularly the warnings herein given. These advanced studies are suitable only for those students who have succeeded in attaining a certain mastery of the inner self, and who have developed a certain amount of psychic force or power which is under their own control. In a certain sense, they may be considered more or less dangerous, but they are not so to one who has progressed sufficiently to be in a position to follow them. Progress is necessary in psychic development as in every other field of endeavor, and those who have gone thus far should try to advance their powers and faculties yet another step forward into that vast and mystic beyond, which encircles us on every side, not only in the life to come, but here and now. Cultivating the Sixth Sense The first thing for the student to do is to cultivate, as far as possible, his sixth sense, already mentioned briefly in Chapter 19, devoted to the cultivation of sensitiveness. This sixth sense is a general feeling of awareness of surrounding powers and entities, a knowledge which is not dependent on any of the five senses. Some of the preliminary exercises for cultivating this sense have already been given, and we shall now proceed to give a few more, leading the student yet further along the path to self-realization and power. 
he should first of all begin with deep breathing exercises accompanied by certain psychical processes and practices the process of taking the complete breath has already been described in chapter six and while the student is in the relaxed condition previously mentioned he should concentrate his mind and carry out the following psychic formula psychic breathing exercises breathe rhythmically until the rhythm is perfectly established then inhaling and exhaling form the mental image of the breath being drawn up through the bones of the legs and then forced out through them then through the bones of the arms then the top of the skull then through the stomach then through the reproductive region then as if it were traveling upward and downward along the spinal column and then as if the breath were being inhaled and exhaled through every pore of the skin the whole body being filled with prana vital energy or life and breathing rhythmically send the current or prana to the seven vital centers in turn as follows using the same mental picture as in the previous exercises first to the very end of the spinal cord second to the reproductive region next to the center of the abdomen next to the solar plexus then to the heart then to the throat then to a spot between the eyes low down on the forehead finally to a spot at the very top of the brain finish by sweeping the current of prana to and fro from head to foot several times how to awaken the chakras or seven vital centers these seven vital centers in the body are known as chakras and have very great interest and importance in all higher psychic development and in all occult practice it is upon the awakening of these seven centers in fact that all the higher clairvoyance and psychical faculties depend they are supposed to be the links of connection between the physical and the astral bodies and if they are not awakened in precisely the right order and in the right manner grave difficulties may result while on the other hand if they are awakened correctly the student who has done so is instantly gifted with extraordinary clairvoyant and higher psychical faculties enabling him not only to see the past and the future but also all those spiritual beings who are constantly around him the thoughts and emotions of others pictures of their past lives etc in other words much depends upon the awakening of these centers in eastern philosophy they are symbolized as lotus flowers and the highest and last in the brain is called the thousand and one petaled lotus importance of awakening in the right order the vital energy which passes upward through these centers is symbolized as a fiery serpent which in passing upward animates each in turn and wakes them into activity and it is highly important that this current of energy should pass through each center in the right order as before said the sensation of warmth and a faint prickling as of pins and needles is felt at the moment of awakening each of these centers in sanskrit the word kundalini literally meaning the coiled up is employed this serpent when fully aroused and activated leads not only to the awakening of the higher psychical faculties before mentioned but also to others of a still more startling character swami vivekananda in his lectures on raja yoga page ninety one gives the following psychical exercises which should be practiced in connection with this psychical unfoldment and development the sacred word om and meditation sit straight and look at the tip of your nose by controlling the two optic nerves one advances a long way towards the control of the arc of reaction and so to the control of the will imagine a lotus upon the top of the head several inches up and virtue as its center the stalk as knowledge the eight petals of the lotus are the eight powers of the yogi inside the stamens and pistils are renunciation inside of the lotus think of the golden one the almighty the intangible he whose name is om the inexpressible surrounded with effulgent light meditate on that 
think of a space in your heart and in the midst of that space think that a flame is burning think of that flame in your own soul and inside that flame in another space effulgent and that is the soul of your soul god meditate on that in the heart he who has given up all attachment all fear and all anger he who has taken refuge in the lord whose heart has become purified with whatsoever desire he comes to the lord he will grant that to him internal or spiritual respiration another valuable practice in connection with breathing is that which is known as internal or spiritual respiration the idea is based upon the belief that in addition to our physical lungs there are also spiritual lungs and that just as the physical lungs receive energy and are purified by the air we breathe so also are the spiritual lungs energized and filled by the power of spirit when accompanied by suitable psychical and mental processes the power of the word om so often repeated in eastern philosophy may be perceived faintly by anyone pronouncing the word slowly several times in succession when it will be seen that it has a peculiar psychical effect upon the individual and that it sets up remarkable rhythmic vibrations throughout the whole being which become more and more noticeable as the word is repeated this is the most holy word of the vedas or sacred books of the east and its symbolic meaning is the supreme being the ocean of knowledge or bliss absolute seeing with any part of the body one other valuable exercise which should be practiced is that of seeing or endeavoring to see with any part of the body as though eyes were situated at any point upon which you concentrate your forces and that you were actually looking outward from that point this power has been cultivated to an extraordinary extent by some of the eastern adepts and is recorded as happening spontaneously now and then even now in the east the power is cultivated by an effort of attention coupled by will and should be preceded by the practice of traveling around the body in thought mentioned before in this book and then holding yourself consciously on one particular point in your circuit of the body and concentrating yourself on that point at this stage of your development you may begin to practice an exercise which would be of great benefit not only to yourself but to others also after you have fallen asleep and the astral body is thereby loosened from the physical body you should learn to make use of this astral body during the hours of sleep and send it on journeys to help those who may be in need of this help you may after a certain amount of effort thus project the astral body and cause it to retain full self-consciousness when this has been acquired this projected body can assist those who have recently died comforting and consoling them and can carry messages from such a person to those still living it can assist those in danger and help along humanity in a thousand different ways when you have learned to project your astral body in this manner during sleep you are known as one of the invisible helpers and many persons are said to make it a business to perform at least one good action every night during sleep the development of cosmic consciousness two remarkable psychical manifestations will result from these spiritual practices if correctly and carefully performed the first is the enlargement of the self until it attains a vast area so to speak which has been called cosmic consciousness by those who have experienced it this consciousness is a step higher than human consciousness just as the human is a step higher than the animal and enables us to perceive truth and spiritual reality behind the universe in addition to stimulating remarkable psychic powers such realities as the fourth dimension which are usually quite incapable of being appreciated by our finite senses are said to be clear and intelligible to those who possess cosmic consciousness and the connection between spirit and matter is also clear to them power over animate and inanimate matter 
the second remarkable development from the awakening of these higher spiritual faculties will be the greater power you possess over animate and inanimate nature you will find that you exert a peculiar influence over all animals with whom you come into contact and that they not only know and understand you but if the animals are wild they will not harm you in any way it is stated that many of the yogis of india can walk uninjured through dense jungles filled with tigers and venomous snakes these facts throw a new and interesting light upon the account of daniel in the den of lions doubtless all the biblical narratives of this kind can be rationally accounted for when we have acquired sufficient knowledge of psychic and spiritual science even the case of the three men who were cast into the fiery furnace and escaped uninjured several mediums have done the same thing on a small scale sir william crooks has reported that he has seen the medium d d holm extract red-hot coals from the fire and hold them in his hands without injury similarly the magicians or witch doctors of many of the savage tribes can walk over glowing coals or red-hot embers without being burned after they have undergone certain religious rites and preparations in addition to this you will have increased power over inorganic matter so that you can move objects without contact with comparative ease and cause phenomenal changes to take place in those objects you will find that you have in an almost perfect degree the power of self-projection that you can leave your body and enter the astral plane at will exploring it and observing its denizens creation by the power of will finally you will be able actually to create by the power of your thought forms and objects which are external and apparently objective in other words you will have learned to create by the power of the will and this is one of the greatest achievements gained by the advanced student of the occult phantoms apparitions thought forms etc are created in this way it is impossible at this time to enter more deeply into these questions higher exercises of this kind to be explained fully as they should be would require a further course of study and it is my intention to follow the present work with a second one which will contain more detailed advice as to the development of the higher psychical and spiritual faculties for the present i must leave the psychic student here at the end of his preparatory studies wishing him success in his efforts in the attainment of psychic power if the student will but follow the directions contained in the present work carefully and at the same time pay due attention to the advice contained therein he will be enabled to develop his psychic powers to a very great extent and will thereby be fitted to undertake still more advanced studies which will be taken up very fully in a subsequent work the end end of chapter forty one advanced studies end of your psychic powers and how to develop them